HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 139, recorded live Monday, November 24th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Miguel de Acaza and Joseph Hill, the folks behind Moonlight. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. This week, we're talking to Joseph Hill and Miguel de Acaza from Novell, from the Mono Project. Thanks, guys, for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Now, Miguel, you're actually on vacation, so you're calling in from Mexico right now? Uh, yes, that is correct. Are you, like, in a, in a, you're in your hotel, or...? No, I'm staying at the at a friend's uh, at a friend's place. So you know, it's it's nice to have friends that can host you when you come here. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks. I didn't realize that you were on uh, on vacation. I appreciate you taking time out of your out of your day. So uh, we got some moonlight uh, announcements here. Uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, we're finally, um, you know, we've been working moonlight for a little bit more than a year now. In the in the first version of uh, of moonlight, uh, and as you as your audience probably knows. Um, it's it's um, it's an implementation of Silverlight 1.0 right now, and uh, we're about to we're about to launch it. Initially, we started this project because we were really excited, uh, not by Silverlight 1.0, but by Silverlight 1.1, which was announced in Mix in 07, I think. And um, so we got really interested about uh, Silverlight 1.1. Uh, but as it turns out, um, you know, a lot of the technology that you needed uh, uh, was uh, you know the foundation. Uh, um, uh, exists in Silverlight 1.0, so we've been working towards that goal. Uh, first ship that version, and um, and what was interesting is that when we started uh, when we started the project, when we started the project, we showed this to a few guys at Microsoft, and uh, and we thought that it would be interesting. Uh, we thought that it would be interesting for the Linux world that uh, to have an open source implementation of Silverlight, something mm-hmm. that would fit more naturally with uh, with what the community does there. So, um, so Microsoft actually um, offered uh, offered us help, and um, so they gave us access to their test suites uh, for Silverlight uh, 1.0 and now for 2.0. And uh, they also gave us, uh, you know, one of the kind of one of the more most complicated problems with Silverlight really was the uh, the media pipeline, uh, you know, mm. the media codecs, because you know many companies own um, you know many companies own patents and they actively license. Um, those media patents for you know MP3, uh, VC1, and uh, uh, WMZ, and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So for us to have a successful um, implementation of Silverlight for Linux, one of the kind of sticky points was how do we get uh, how do we get media to Linux users um, uh, in a fully legit way? So you know a fully licensed uh, version of the codex. So Microsoft actually stepped up and uh, and um, and they are actually providing the codex. It's not Novell that provides the codex. Um, that is the one piece that uh, that is the one kind of a uh, piece that is not open source. Uh, the, the actual video codex and audio codex. So the way it's going to work is when you um, when you install Silverlight in your system through you know through uh, through a plugin for Firefox. Uh, the first time that you that you try to play any media, any MP3s or any videos, uh, mm-hmm. it will it will ask you whether you want to download the codex from Microsoft. It will go and fetch uh, the codex from Microsoft and install those on your system. And, uh, and in that way, we ensure that every, uh, that every user of Silverlight on Linux will have a fully licensed um, uh, media stack in addition to, to the Moonlight um, engine. Then, um, so, you know, um, so it's, it, it's been quite interesting um, working on this because, you know, I, uh, we started just with the, with the sample codes, and when Microsoft came in and gave us the test suites, uh, we finally had something, you know, uh, very comprehensive to aim for and, uh, you know, we worked for the past uh, nine months on making sure that uh, that our Silverlight 1.0 passed every one of the Microsoft test suites. Uh, mm-hmm. The only thing that is uh, that the only test that we kind of uh, uh, not run perfectly are the ones that are related to fonts because the default set of fonts that come with Linux are different than the default set of fonts 
that you get on Windows. But other than that, uh, we're you know we're fully compatible at this point. Uh, sure. Well, as fully compatible as you can, you know, as you can, uh, as you can, uh, as you can do it with uh, with uh, with functional tests. That's pretty slick. Now, why why do you prompt them? Why do you have to uh, pull the codex down later? I'm curious. Um, well, because the so so it has to do with the way that these codecs are licensed. Microsoft is already a licensor and already you know. Um, well, I guess I guess we could download it immediately as soon as you install Monday. Is that your question? I guess we could do that. Um, well, I guess I mean I, I don't with. quite understand software licensing and that complicated. But I suppose that if there are if there is a set of people who are using it but are not using it for media, then I guess someone doesn't have to pay someone for the license. Yeah. Well, that, so yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than that about who pays whom. But um, uh, because right now it's Microsoft that you know is distributing the codec, so it goes into. Whatever Microsoft agreement has with the with the with the media owners, I mean the media codec owners. So I don't I don't actually know the details of that. Uh, but you're right. We could uh, we could make it so that the first time you install Moonlight, uh, as soon as you install Moonlight, it also gets the codex. And uh, and you know right now it's uh, right now it's either done the first time you do it or when you uh, explicitly request to get the codex. So I I've got a couple of Ubuntu machines around here, but I'm not deeply familiar with. Uh, with Linux as a user, what mm-hmm. is the experience like? I mean, is this something that you have to do? You have to jump out to the command line and su this and that and sudo this and that to get this installed? <laughs> oh, no, or? not at all. We actually we're actually very proud of uh, of uh, of the solution we came up uh, we came up with. It's very similar to the Windows experience. Uh, right now, uh, you know, we're recording this interview before we go live, um, so. So right now you can't see the experience, but you will end up on the Microsoft Serverlight site. It will detect your browser based on your, uh, uh, you know, when you get this little icon that says, uh, you know, you're missing Silverlight, click here to install. Uh, you will click there, and uh, when you get to the Microsoft website, it will detect that you're running a Linux system. So it will forward you, uh, depending on the architecture that you're using, it will, send us, it, it, will, it will send you directly to one of our servers. And then a little pop-up comes up and uh, just asks you, um, the, um, just ask you to install it. Uh, or do you agree to install this piece of software that has been signed by Novell? Then you say okay, and then that's it. It downloads it. The only difference that we, uh, the only difference with the uh, with the Silverlight experience is that we are not able to uh, to restart the browser ourselves. So we need to, you know, it, it will tell you the plugin will be active as soon as you restart uh, the browser. Um, so how many architectures and how many browsers will you support? So uh, at the launch time, we're, we're going to support uh, x86 and x86-64, and I think, uh, you know, if it wasn't for, well, I think it's going to be really good because, you know, uh, we're coming out with both uh, both of the major architecture supporters from the get-go. Mm-hmm. The, um, and we're going to support Firefox 2 and Firefox 3. We do have experimental bindings, uh, but they're not completed. Uh, we hope to complete them in the future. Uh, Opera bindings and WebKit bindings, uh, in particular WebKit because it's becoming very popular um, on Linux. So we will have uh, support for the other browsers, but right now there's no major, really there's no product um, uh, productized version of WebKit right now uh, mm-hmm. available to the public. So, you know, as soon as that, that happens, we'll have a WebKit version as well, or, or multiple WebKit versions. So we designed it kind of with a little bridge that, uh, you know, the plugin is, the shared infrastructure is, is all the same across all plugins, and then we have little loadable modules that are different across browsers. The plugin architecture on Linux is pretty much the same. Is, is it DP API or NP API rather? We, we use the NP API for Mozilla. So here's the thing: the problem is that not every browser uses the same API. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, at the foundational level, for the most basic things, uh, I, everybody uses NP, the Mozilla NP API. But the problem is that Silverlight actually takes advantage of a lot more features in the browser than uh, the, uh, the, the basic plugin APIs uh, provide. Uh, for example, Silverlight applications are able to communicate with the DOM, right? So you can manipulate the DOM from Silverlight, right, and make changes to the DOM or extract data from the DOM. Uh, mm-hmm. And it gives a very seamless experience uh, between the DOM and the Silverlight application. So you can, you know, the, the distinction between what is Silverlight and what is the browser is, is blurred. But to achieve that, um, the you know you need to to, to speak uh, browser specific APIs in each one of those. So in in the case of Mozilla, we speak um, we speak through um, um, this API they call XPCOM. So we have to speak with Mozilla with XPCOM, but that obviously doesn't exist in WebKit and doesn't exist in Opera. So we need to use in the Opera case the Opera APIs that would give us the same integration. And the same thing goes for WebKit. 
Now, does this get pretty complicated, or do you have a nice provider uh, abstraction yes. to, to make that not so hard? Yes, yes, yes. It's very nice. So, you know, we're, I mean, um, kind of, um, we're looking forward for the WebKit ones to come out. And uh, also, Microsoft has agreed, I mean, you guys have agreed uh, to also <laughs> publish a codex for other architectures. So, for example, Linux and PowerPC and, um, and you know, Linux on uh, Spark computers, so we can distribute. Um, uh, Moonlight, uh, Moonlight, not only for Linux machines, but we also want to get it on FreeBSD computers. We want to get it in Solaris and up in Solaris. Um, so we kind of want to see, uh, uh, we kind of want to see Moonlight go into all of those platforms that are not, uh, you know, that are not supported uh, uh, directly by, you know, all those Unixes that are not uh, the most popular ones. And it's relatively easy for us to do that. Uh, we're already getting some contributions from the community to do that. So. Um, so you know, we'll be very happy to fill in the void of all those other platforms. Now, from the from the point, let's let me play devil's advocate for a second. From the point of view of of a Microsoft user, um, not a, not mm-hmm. an employee, but just I'm a guy who uses Windows. Windows has like ninety percent share, and uh, yeah. Mac has you know nine point nine nine percent share, and and then Linux is everybody else. And then when you yeah. start talking about subgroups within Linux, you know, Solaris, and you know, you must be talking about fractions of a percent of as far as when you put it in the entire bucket of all the different computers out there that are Windows. Is that a lot of work to support some of these more obscure, and hopefully obscure is not an offensive word, but these more obscure platforms? Um, I I think it's a really good point. Um, I I think that at the end of the day, the shared uh, idea that we have with the Microsoft guys right now is we really like Silverlight as a developer platform, and we want to make it available everywhere. So... You know, I, we don't want it to come down to, I mean, if a developer has to, at some point, it, it has to come down as to, you know, it has to run on Solaris, we wouldn't want the fact that it's not there uh, to stop it. Now, of course, I dispute the claim that we're so so small, the Linux uh, faction. I think we're growing and striving. Uh, maybe not growing and striving at like other ones, but, you know, I think we're yeah, growing. Yeah. But, um, so, but when it comes to, uh, about, uh, to the actual differences between Solaris and uh, BSD and Linux, they are... You know, the DNA is almost exactly the same. It's, uh, you, you should probably think of it in terms of what is the difference between making a program work in Windows 2000 and, and Windows Vista, right? Hmm. So there's certain things that you probably want to make a little bit different if you want to take advantage of Vista and fall back gracefully when you run on Windows 2000. So you think of it the same way uh, because the graphics system is the same. Uh, it's always X11. It's called X11. Um, the... Uh, um, you know, the Unix facilities, the operating system facilities are almost identical. Uh, there's probably, uh, you know, four or five if that's in the source code that deal with differences between those two. And the third piece is um, the kind of the hardest part to port, and that's really a Moonlight 2.0 issue more than a Moonlight 1.0 issue, is uh, porting the .NET, you know, the .NET, uh, you know, the core CLR uh, to these operating systems. And those operating systems we already support um, and I agree, they're probably not the biggest or the largest uh, operating systems, but I think that having, uh, being able to say, we're going to run on all of those Unixes, uh, regardless of which one you have, I think it's uh, really useful. And kind of the, 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 the part that happens here is that we don't really have to do all of the work ourselves. Uh, what is really interesting about the nature of open source here is um, if someone really, really, really needs it in Solaris or, uh, you know, or a specific variant of, uh, of BSD, uh, you know, they can always uh, they can always do the work and we'll be you know we'll be happy to to crank out a build for them or and uh, and get the codex over to Microsoft so that they can distribute those. Yeah, it's pretty cool that you're saying that they're going to be able to go up to serverlight.net and they're going to get detected and be a first class citizen like everybody else. Have you found anybody at Microsoft to be um for lack of a better word evil? No, no. Well, you, you know, uh, uh my, the contact that I have with Microsoft, uh, with the Microsoft guys, has been through Mono and through uh, and through Silverlight, and uh, I think that everybody that I've interacted with at, uh, at Microsoft, with no, everybody I've interacted, uh, 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 everybody I talked to at Microsoft about Moonlight or Silverlight, um, they've been always been great, and I think that they share the same uh, the same passion that we do for. Um, um, for the technology, you know, I absolutely uh, love working with uh, with all of them. I think that you know, when people talk about evil, I mean, um, you know, I don't think we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I think that uh, that <laughs> completely blurs any actual rational discourse. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's not a black and white world. There's all of these, you know, 
it's a it's a gamma you know it's a complete uh, uh, spectrum a gradient. of colors so yeah. So, you know, I have never had a problem with, uh, you know, I happen to like Linux. I happen to believe that, um, you know, I want to run an open source operating system. But, uh, but you know, if somebody wants to run Windows or wants to run a Mac or wants to run Solaris, you know, more power to them. So, you know, I, I kind of don't like to take that, that position, um, you know. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman with a word from our sponsor. Do you know how to build Web 2.0 AJAX applications with Web 1.0 components? You really can't. If you want to do the next-generation web applications, you'll need next-generation components, just like the ones that our friends at Telerik have got. They're rad controls for ASP.NET AJAX. It's a huge pack of web controls built on top of ASP.NET AJAX that'll add previously impossible performance and interactivity to your next project. The new controls mirror the AJAX API from ASP.NET, so development is really straightforward. The client scripts are shared, so loading time is not a problem. You just set a couple of properties, and you'll be able to automatically bind to web services for a really efficient operation. The new RAD editor from ASP.NET AJAX Telerik loads up to four times faster than before, and the new RAD grid handles thousands of records in just milliseconds. But, as always, it's best to try for yourself. So you can visit telerik.com slash ASP.NET AJAX and download a trial. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people they feel very strongly about one, you know, Microsoft one way or the other. And I, I've always said one of the reasons that I came to work for Microsoft a year ago was that uh, things are changing and that the attitude towards open source is is dramatically changing. And, and I, you know, I've always said that uh, in the next couple of years we're going to see big changes at Microsoft. We've already seen them with with MVC, and I, I, I can only imagine that those things are going to going to get even bigger. I think that the interactions that Microsoft has with with the Moonlight team and the Mono team is maybe not as as public and as visible as some of the other open source stuff we do. And I I don't know. I, I wonder um, if there is some way to explain to people how how those interactions work. I mean, do you just call up a dev whenever you need something, and how do they make sure that they don't accidentally you know taint you? They're always concerned. We're always concerned about Mono yeah. people seeing something they're not supposed to see, and then you know you have to be killed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned. No. <laughs> So the uh, so kind of it's been a really organic uh, relationship. Uh, it kind of begun it kind of begun with uh, with us getting involved with ECMA. Um, at the time, Microsoft was pushing uh, C Sharp and the .NET VM through uh, the ECMA standards process. And uh, since we were a tiny little startup, we actually were invited by IBM as guests uh, to the meetings. And you know, you get to st- you start meeting people, and you start you know they, they become um, you know. Uh, you, you keep a couple of email addresses, and whenever you have a question, you drop them an email. And uh, so it became kind of a, a very organic thing, just like when you go to a conference and you meet people. It, it was the exact same thing, um, just uh, popping up and, and, and talking to folks. And, uh, you know, over time when we, when we decided to work with Microsoft together on this, um, you, know, I got a, you know, I got a bunch of more email addresses. Uh, so Brian Goffworks, I always, you know, I always drop an email to Brian and say, hey, Brian, we need help with this. And he he usually just points us in the right direction. Says, "Oh, you need to talk right. to this person, that person." And you know, it's it's very organic. Um, I mean, it feels very. I mean, at least our collaboration with Microsoft feels very open sourcey, um, in that it's the exact same process that we follow with anyone else in the community, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, th- there's really no different from our standpoint. I think it's an incredibly open sourcey way, and uh, and it goes back to what you're saying. I think not only I, I think that not only Microsoft is changing, but you know, the whole industry is, you know, 10 years ago, there was none of this, right? So everybody has to adapt and change to, you know, uh, the Internet being ubiquitous, phones being ubiquitous, you know, all of these things. And I think that Microsoft is doing great that, uh, you know, um, keeping up with all of this stuff that is happening. Yeah. yeah I don't know how the listeners would uh, would, would thought that this, this interaction was going to be, but I guess I somehow imagined that, you guys would come to a table and there'd be some, someone would put some tape on the table and the open source people would stay on that side of the table. It would be very formal and there'd be all sorts of lawyers and people worrying about stuff. Uh, but, so, but, there are, so there are some, you know, they gave us specifications and they said we have a very clear agreement. Uh, they gave us specs and, uh, and this is a specification that must be implemented and the rest we really do on our own. Uh, the only piece that we kind of been exposed to, which is proprietary code, is a codex because we had to do some work on that. But other than that, you know, um, I think we've maintained a very clear separation between uh, Microsoft ideas and technology and the way we implemented ours. So, so let me ask you this, and this might be a question for, for Joseph, who's been pretty quiet so far, is 
what is what's in it for you guys? I mean, why is Novell going to so much effort to make mono mono? I mean, where does the money come from? Well, um, I mean, I think you know, first and foremost, it's uh, I mean, it's really about enriching the 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 desktop story. For uh, I mean, we have you know, we have a desktop uh, SUSE Linux um, that you know we're out there promoting, and um, not having you know, not having access to Silverlight content on our desktop is not a very uh, appealing proposition. So, I mean, just from just from that standpoint, it's uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty compelling case to say, hey, you know, we can be the people that are gonna, you know, that are going to enable this, um, you know, not only for for our desktop, but you know, for all Linux desktops. Um, you know, beyond that, um, you know, it's well, I mean, that's that's pretty much the Nobel story. But beyond that, I mean, it's it's very it's very interesting. Um, you know, technically, and um, you know, as far as the avenues, it, it opens up for us for you know an interesting way to leverage mono, and um, you know, interesting um, avenue for the you know for the joint work that uh, that we do with Microsoft. So um, you know, I think initially it just started as as, as building out that desktop story, but it, it opens up uh, a lot of pathways that you know weren't there, you know, particularly before the collaboration. Are there any examples of stuff where you've take where where Novell, the larger company, has taken, you know, stuff out of the team, code, intellectual property, whatever, and and pushed it into some other thing, or where maybe uh, you know someone inside of Novell said, "Oh, I'm going to write that in Mono," and uh, you know, wouldn't have done that had you not been part of the the larger company. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of uh, projects that we built inside Novell um, that were all based on Mono. And I don't think that uh, had they not uh, acquired Zimian, they would have done those projects in Mono. Um, so I guess uh, taking kind of a little bit step back um, to why we're building it, uh, there, w- there were two elements. One of them is we really like the technology in terms of what .NET could do for developers. And, uh, you know, it's a story that I always tell, which is I was kind of jealous that the Windows people were getting this fantastic developer technology and, you know, Linux was lagging behind again. Uh, so we wanted to bring that technology to Linux, and you know, on the other hand, it allows us to it allows us to run a lot of very interesting code on Linux. So not only you can run applications, but you have access to all of those .NET libraries that exist out there uh, that you can build uh, your software with. So it it kind of give you it gives you it gives you you know the possibility of moving your software around and not be uh, entirely tied to Windows. And uh, it's funny, some of the software that we're building now. Um, is for the first time. Uh, for the first time, we're transporting the software was built for Linux only, and it's going into Windows uh, and the Mac. And it's something that we didn't plan on initially. I mean, it would have been nice, but we never thought about that. And uh, and now it's finally, uh, you know, crossing the uh, crossing the you know to the other side. And in fact, there's a couple of uh, you know uh, we work with uh, with a company in, in Denmark called Unity, and uh, their product is it, their product was entirely uh, you know macOS based with Mono. Only macOS, it wouldn't even run on Linux. It was just, you know, 100% macOS. And um, and thanks to Mono, <laughs> they're going to start offering their product, which I think is a killer product. They're going to start offering it on, on, on Windows now. So it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, situation where you have a lot of code mobility going back and forth. Huh. Now, what's, what's the future of that? I mean, it seems like... Uh, there's been a number, amount of, a lot of speculation around Unity, and everyone's talking. Everyone's seeing, you know, shadowy videos of Mono on the iPhone. And w- w- are you thinking we're going to get Silverlight on the iPhone at some point? Is that the goal? Uh, we definitely want to. Um, kind of the problem with the with the, the problem with the iPhone is uh, is the Apple terms of uh, of uh, you know is really the license that Apple gives you to develop applications for the iPhone, and they basically stated. Um, both at the you know at the legal agreement that you signed with them and uh, you know at the kernel level they disable uh, JIT uh, JIT engine so you can't really uh, just in time compile code for that thing and you can't really um, and they don't allow you to use any interpreter which is not provided by them which which is the reason why you can't have Flash and why you can't have Silverlight and why you can't have you know Python on the iPhone it's uh, it comes down to a um, to a legal issue and also um, um, uh, the kernel enforcing some of those pieces. So one of the things that we want to do to be completely, uh, you know, within the, uh, you know, completely legit and uh, completely following Apple's requirements is do a static compilation of Silverlight. Now, uh, the upside is uh, you'll be able to bring Silverlight applications to the iPhone. The downside, though, is that you it's not going to work inside the browser. It's not something that you're going to go to a web page and it's going to work. Uh, 
the only way that is going to work is you're going to have to build your Silverlight app and then, uh, you know, distribute it through either the Apple channel, you know, uh, through Apple's uh, distribution channel in the App Store, or you use the enterprise deployment feature um, that allows you to, you know, deploy your application to your own uh, internal users. But, um, but there's not, you know, it's not going to integrate into the web. You will be able to build Silverlight applications, but they just won't be inside a web browser. So that is a little bit of, uh, you know, it's a little bit uh, sad that those uh, restrictions are in place. But on the other hand, um, you know, if you built a Silverlight app, at least we're going to be able to bring it to, to a phone and it will be, uh, you know, you're going to get more of a desktop experience with it than a, than a web experience. Can you speak a little more about how they are preventing this? I'm not clear uh, if these are guidelines like don't be naughty or if there's something no. that they've actually physically changed to prevent someone from doing what you're saying, to doing jitter. So there, yeah, there are two pieces. Uh, the te- on the technical side, they, um, you know, when you uh, just in time compile code, you basically transform the bytecodes that you get, these, uh, you know, common intermediate language bytecodes, and you translate them on the fly to native, uh, you know, x86, or and in this case, ARM, you know, ARM uh, code. And uh, mm-hmm. you, you write that stuff into memory. Once you've uh, compiled the function, let's say the function, you know, uh, uh, printf, right? Once you've JIT compiled the function printf, the, the next step is you need to turn that page from writable, right, that, that, that chunk of memory that you just wrote into, you need to slip on a bit that tells the CPU you can execute the code on this page. And that's the, te- the, te- the technology that JIT compilers use. Uh, what they do is they write into memory, and once they're done, they flip this bit and they let the CPU execute code there. So in the iPhone uh, operating system 1.0, you were able to do that. With 2.0, uh, starting with 2.0 or 2.1, 2.0, um, they disabled that feature. So you're not uh, physically able to implement the JIT engine. Uh, so that means that nothing like V9 or Java or .NET can actually run using JIT technology. Um, hmm. So what we do have, what we think that is a kind of a unique offering in Mono is we're able to do a full static compilation of .NET code uh, without having any just-in-time compilation uh, like Java or .NET or Flash or V9 do. do. So I think that that's, that's the reason why we will, we, we're going to be able to do that, uh, uh, to do that for, for Silverlight on the iPhone. Now, the other piece... The other piece is a legal piece, um, and they basically the, the the Apple agreement um, is that you will not run that you agree that you will not implement an interpreter or implement a JIT compiler that will let you execute arbitrary code that has not been approved by Apple. And mm-hmm. um, uh, I don't know the reasons. I suspect that they want to make sure that everything that runs on the iPhone uh, will go through the App Store. Um, through the App Store. And, and I guess that if you were able to basically just ship Flash or Silverlight, then any apps can make it into the iPhone. So, you know, we can speculate why Apple did that, but, uh, but uh, those are the two, the two restrictions. One is legal, the other one is technical. Huh. So the way that you're getting around the jitting part is you're basically, if I understand correctly, you're doing like an NGen of the, of the code yourself. Exactly. Think of NGen Plus. Uh, so engine, engine still needs a tiny little bit of... Uh, of, uh, mm-hmm. of runtime support, and we compl- and basically what we did is we took this extra step where we completely, you know, we completely rip out the JIT engine. There's not even a JIT engine running on the on Mon on the iPhone at that point. Hmm. So do you do you anticipate, uh, you know, in six months or a year, someone's going to be able to just fire up an IDE and go file new iPhone application and then start writing away in C sharp, maybe using Mono Develop or Eclipse? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, so today it's already possible. Um, you can do it today. I mean, the Unity guys have basically done the entire work for the pipeline. Now, the, they're focused on gaming, so you really kind of, you know, all the APIs that you have accessible are, you know, MS Core Lib Plus gaming APIs, which, you know, if you're a gamer, it's perfect. If you're not, then, 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 <laughs> then it's not. But um, so Unity already has that, and it's selling the product right now. Uh, they've been selling it for a month now. So that, that does exist today. But what we want to do is, uh, is effectively, you know, uh, make a more interesting offering for the iPhone. Um, you know, at, at some point we thought, well, what about compact framework? And, uh, you know, bringing a uh, compact framework to the iPhone. And we thought, um, and, and we didn't think that, I mean, we think that the future is Silverlight, not really Windows Forms. So I think what we're going to go, to, what we want to do eventually is, uh, is do a Silverlight. Um, basically, you build your Silverlight application and we'll have a tool that, you know, will transform your zap file into a into a binary that you can give Apple for distribution. 
So you will continue hmm. the Visual Studio. Uh, you'll instead of designing, you know, against a huge canvas, you'll design against the canvas that is, you know, the size of the phone. Um, I don't know, mm-hmm. 300 by 600 or 500, and then uh, and then just convert the zap into a into a into a native application. Now, when you've got both, if you get both Mono and Serverlite running on an iPhone, is there a reason for both, or would you just say, well, we'll just, you know, Serverlite will be our way, we'll do things. I think Silverlight should be it. Um, you know, we we talked about this because I think that uh, the iPhone is a is a is a hot gadget. Um, but uh, right now, you know, we think. I mean, all of our efforts are really on Silverlight. So, um, so we had a couple of options. One was build native, you know, build native APIs for for the for the iPhone. But then, mm-hmm. you know, the testing becomes very cumbersome. Um, it will be a macOS only solution. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work and, you know, we've built a bunch of toolkits in the past, you know, this is our third or fourth toolkit we're building. So mm-hmm. we really don't want to go down that path of, of, of doing all of that work. It seems like a lot of work. And it would also yeah. be, you know, it would be another API the developers would have to learn. It, you know, it would be limited in, in how, you know, there would be no books, there would be zero reference material. So, it, it, I mean, somebody might be able to do that, but I think that really the feature is just to... Uh, just to build it on Silverlight because Silverlight is well documented. There's tons of books, you know, you can get help anywhere. You can go to Stack Overflow and, you know, a hundred people will answer your questions. Um, right. So, I mean, there are probably other ways of doing uh, things on the iPhone. I just don't think they're very, I mean, considering the size of our team and considering, uh, you know, just the dynamics of the market, I think it would be better to just say, we'll get you Silverlight. And what we'll probably do is we'll do a template that makes, the application looks like an iPhone application, right? So, right, and that would that would mean a series of controls, and basically you'd be doing owner draw XAML that would look iPhoneish, and ultimately yeah. people would be it'd be pixel by pixel perfect, but it that's wouldn't right. really be the native APIs. That's right. That's right. So people will continue to use Silverlight APIs, and you know we can what we can do is we can take the Microsoft, uh, you know, you guys open source the 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 controls for uh, for Silverlight, so. What we have to do is, you know, learn from the source and kind of, you know, build a nice template that would look iPhone-ish and then, you know, ship it on the iPhone. So that way nobody would be able to tell the difference between uh, between a Silverlight app and an iPhone app if, if they don't want to, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Now, last question is, uh, is Moonlight, does it, have a, does it have a reason to live on Windows or is it not going to be a Windows thing? There's no reason to have Moonlight on Windows if you've got Silverlight on Windows already. Well, um you know, we thought the same thing about Mono. We thought uh, we should never bring it to, uh, we will never bring it to um, to Windows because it's, you know, Windows has .NET. But it turned out that people actually use Mono on Windows a lot. Um, so maybe one day we'll bring it. Right now our focus is really, uh, really on Linux, but, you know, it's open source. If somebody really cares and has a, you know, a, a reason or a business reason to do it, um, I don't know mm-hmm. what that reason would be today, but, you know. That's kind of the uh, what happens with this, you know, incredibly democratized, uh, you know, uh, hacker universe that we have these days. You know, so many people are doing so many different things for God knows what reasons. Yeah, you know, well, someone was commenting that they really wanted to have a tiny, tiny CLR for Windows that was like X copy deployable, and you know, you yes. could strip down Mono or use uh, Moonlight and have a little portable application. That would have nothing. It would have no install. You just basically, you know, a single statically linked app that would be using Mono as its uh, yes. as its engine or Moonlight as its engine. I suppose you could do something like that. Yeah, that's actually what the use case is today for for the Windows case, and um, and mm-hmm. it's been done mostly by the gaming people, uh, by people that build games. So it's funny. It's one of those situations where uh, people are using Mono and they're not even bringing their apps to Linux. You know, it's a very Windows centric. Uh, you know, it's a Windows app. They just happen to embed a tiny CLR uh, for their game in their, you know, when they ship. So, yeah, may- maybe something like that would happen with Moonlight. Uh, yeah, so, so you're saying I might be running one of these right now and have no idea that, that Mono's on my machine and running in a game. Uh, yeah, well, the first, you know, the first major game that I know of, but I can't say the name in public, is coming in mm-hmm. late February. Oh, but I'll never That's know. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. So it's, a, it's a major game. So uh, until late February, I don't think you have it right now. Or if you go uh-huh. to, uh, you know, if you're uh, into, uh, if you have kids, uh, you know, five to five to eight, um, I think it's uh, Cartoon Network um, is using it now uh, for oh, really? Phone Call or Fun Bum or Fun Ball. 
or Funzy Ball. <laughs> Something like that. It's yeah, it's one Fusion uh, Fall. Fusion Fall, Fusion Fall, yeah. So if you go to Fusion Fall and you sign up for Fusion Fall, it's a massive mm-hmm. multiplayer online gaming. It's a little bit like a World of Warcraft, but for you know, uh, for young kids. And it's very <laughs> World of Warcraft for toddlers. Yes, exactly. World of Warcraft for toddlers, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Using mono. Exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Well, Miguel and Joseph, thanks so much for sitting down to talk with me today on the show. I know that, again, you're on vacation, Miguel, so I'll let you get back to uh, the beach or the mountains or wherever you are in Mexico. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.